Hello, my friends, and welcome back to Arthur Ray Podcast. I upload once a week, and if you like the podcast, you should subscribe to the channel. Today's guest is Kusti Salm. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Can you tell the viewer who are you and what do you do? Uh, yes, my name is Kusti Salm. As you said, I'm the permanent secretary of the Estonian Minister of Defense. And what it means for the older viewers who are not familiar with the Estonian uh, official names, then uh, I'm basically the highest civil servant in the Estonian defense system, meaning that I, well, in my position I oversee defense procurement, uh, defense legislation, also defense uh, personnel manning issues uh, and everything that's going on in Estonian defense structures. Okay, thank you for that. I have a few questions lined up for you, some about Estonia and some about Estonia in NATO. So there's Go the ahead. approach. All right, I'll start. Um, how is the Estonian security um, situation different on the Russian border than it was before the war that started 24th February 2022? All right, you, you go right to the business. Um, the, business. Um, the sentence we usually... Um, construct here is that there is no imminent military threat to Estonia. Uh, but the emphasis in this sentence isn't on the word threat. The emphasis on on word imminent and military, uh, meaning that in uh, in the you know, one or two year time frame, we really don't see a threat in itself because most of Russian forces are engaged in Ukraine. But when we go over the horizon, then clearly the threat is there. Clearly, this is much higher than it was 24th February 2022. Clearly, uh, we are uh, pretty much convinced of this because Russian Federation have made sure what their intent is. And their intent, there is nothing secret about this. They issued a paper uh, uh, 2021, in December, three or four pages of different demands to NATO and, uh, and US. And if you read through them carefully, then there were only two points out of 30 or something that spoke about Ukraine. Rest of them speak about Eastern European, uh, Eastern Europe pushing NATO back to uh, where it was in 1997, which basically means cutting off the uh, collective defense umbrella from you know, throughout Eastern Europe. And this clearly is an existential question for us. Uh, and clearly the only thing we can do is to ramp up our defenses and make sure that uh, every inch of Estonia and, and the uh, other NATO territories uh, defended. Uh, well, I personally, when I found out that the, the troops on the Russian side that were meant for these areas, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, have been sent to Ukraine, and I, it's going to sound bad, I saw what happened to these troops. We all know what happened to these troops. I, I did feel personally relieved because I knew what these troops were doing on the Russian border. Their only goal was to be here, to be a deterrent or to be uh, faced towards the Baltics. And am I correct to feel relieved or is it illusory? Well, the re relief might not be the best adjective to describe it. <laughs> um, well, the fact of the matter is that the Russian uh, armed forces are employing the reserve system as well as Estonia is. Um, and... Uh, they generate the reserves through conscription. And as we have now witnessed, they are also able to quickly mobilize uh, their reserves if needed. Uh, and we have taken a very careful look into the same 76th uh, year assault division that is just a few, few kilometers from Estonian border. Mm -hmm. um, then their ability to uh, get back to their feet or on the same being wh where they were before the 24th of uh, February 2022 would take a year. Uh, and the year is a very, very short period. And also we need to amplify uh, this with well, all the activities going on in uh, Russia currently, meaning ramping up the manufacturing capabilities, making sure that basically the whole society is harnessed um, uh, in front of, um, in front of uh, executing the war effort. And, and clearly I, I don't really know anyone who doubts uh, of the uh, Russian leadership's determination to win the war. So we, we need to be extremely careful um, uh, on, on these developments. One year, that, that means they would have to mobilize, they would have to train the troops. If, if we're talking about the year, what, 12 months later, they have all done all of this, would you say the quality of these new troops in the 76th Division would be worse than it was pre-war, when they weren't going through the mince, mince meat machine? 
Well, we, we can de debate this, and, uh, and clearly there's a strong argument in this that probably they won't be on the same level. Uh, but at the same time, we need to understand that uh, the level will be amplified. It will be uh, multipled with the, uh, the years-long experience from the war. Mm -hmm. uh, the understanding of what, what weapons work, what don't work, and then all the determination. Um, and uh, th this might be even more important thing on the battlefield than uh, um, than just the you know the equ equipment tables. And even if you look at the, and this really goes into the Ukrainian war, if you look at all the YouTube videos and Twitter posts and everything that uh, you know makes mockery of the Russian mobilized soldiers. There's a lot. And where they make mockery of themselves and their equipment and everything like that. It's very rarely when you witness something where they doubt the content of the war or the end goal of the war. And I think this tells a very, very powerful story about the, uh, about the determination and the moral of, of these soldiers. And, you know, we, we need to observe this with a, with a very uh, cur curious uh, Curious uh, point of view. This is very new to me. I have uh, I have personally made fun of of Russian equipment and Russian mobilization process. I guess it makes it easy for me to cope with with the fear of this process. But as you can see, yes, I haven't seen the soldiers doubting the end goal of the war. I see them doubting the Kalashnikov that is rusty, but not the end goal of Vladimir Putin. So this is scary to think about it like that. But recently I read a headline that 600 soldiers mutinied in Luhansk and, and we read headlines all the time that their morals are low, the moral is low, but you're stating now that they understand the end goal. So is the Russian fighting force low morale or, or not? Well, I think on Western standards and I mean on the standards of Estonian conscription and reserve system, it's clearly very low. There, there is no, you know, question about that if you put it on a comparative scale. But um, I, I don't think that the benchmark for assessing the Russian soldiers' morale is, is a Western standard. Mm. This is the standard of Russian morale in Afghanistan war, in Second World War, and in the wars before that. And clearly, there are no stories about uh, sort of uh, high morale of Russian uh, soldiers. Russian soldiers have always been disposable. They are like, well, I hate to say it like this, but they are like baby diapers. You know, you can throw them away. Uh, they are a biomass. Um, and I think um, this is something that we also need to see in, in a correct comparative scale. You mentioned 500, 600 troops a, a week. For Estonian terms, this would be a catastrophe. I think in every NATO's army, um, benchmark, this would be something that would clearly make it a political issue. Um, but in Russia, uh, 100,000 is not so much of a big deal if your reserve structure that you can basically mobilize in, in the matter of weeks, uh, it's not such a big deal because it's, it's uh, less than 1%. It is truly, yeah, if you think about these numbers, but lacking military gear, lacking even Kalashnikovs or winter gear, for me as a civilian right now, it, it is worrying that they, they don't have proper jackets, but as you can say, they're biomass, I guess they don't care about that, but that takes away their capabilities, right? If, if they don't have warm clothing for the winter. Well, that's true. I mean, on the individual level, that's, that's great. But at the same time, we need to keep in mind that there is a very high level of quality also in, in, in terms of quality or in, in quantities, sorry. Um, meaning that I remember very clearly from the late September, there were, I don't know about your podcast, but there were many who were claiming that there is no way Russians going to mobilize. There is no way their system going to... You know, upkeep this. There is no way there is political willingness and, and the public support for this. Uh, yes, same. Yet they I did was, it. Yeah. Yet they got 150,000 from the streets, like carpenters, taxi drivers, to the trenches. In five weeks, 150,000. As a logistic undertaking, that's a huge effort. And they're continuing with this. Uh, and uh, the first trenches were the cap fillers, 
next ones are are already trained into the units. Uh, yeah, we can complain about their equipment and, and everything, but uh, even poorly trained 150,000 soldiers is a large force. It's scary to listen to this, honestly. It's it's very eye-opening for me. I've always coped with these numbers and everything by making a comedic approach to it and, and focusing on how bad the gear is, how bad the equipment is, and it's just quantity. But as you can say, they are, there is quality in quantity, and it scares me a little bit, honestly, as a person. But I'll ask now about Estonia. Don't, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Um, what would be the biggest changes in the Estonian defense that Estonia has made from the lessons of Ukrainian war? Well, first of all, I, I want to make this sure that um, we, we have had no illusions on the Russian military threat since 30 years. And uh, the, whole, the, the whole defense structure, starting from conscription, reserve army, the way we equip, uh, weaponize ourselves, is uh, turned against this potential threat. Um, it just became more evident uh, with, with uh, Ukraine and uh, probably it became a little bit more acute. Um, but clearly what we have done, um, we have invested a lot of new money into defense. Uh, actually, in 2022, we bought more ammunition altogether than in the last 30 years, twice as much. So oh. that's a lot of ammunition. Actually, Estonia was, I think as a fact, we might have been one of the largest uh, weapon purchaser in European market in 2022. And everything from the smallest calibers, from the individual weapons to the artillery, anti-tank, anti-air, everything. Uh, that's a lot of stuff. We have um, uh, put a lot of emph emphasis, and this is one of the um, direct outcomes or the lessons from uh, Ukraine war, again, that we knew already before, but that were just amplified, indirect fire. We need to be able to influence our opponent from the larger distance, preferably from longer distance than uh, all the Russians are able. Uh, so we have bought extra um, batches of uh, K9s. So now 36 under contract, we're going to have two very, very capable battalions, uh, both in the, both of brigades. Uh, we have um, signed an agreement for HIMARS. Well, everyone knows what HIMARS is. Uh, this is the first time we got a serious capability of uh, hitting targets um, on the other side of the line, meaning we are going to change the calculus of potential adversary. They need to relook their uh, logistic change, command posts, the way they resupply themselves, and, and, and it makes defending or attacking Estonia more costlier. Huge effect. Um, we are going to uh, buy a loitering munition. Um, mm. Well, the same stuff that's been used in Ukraine, we're going to acquire the same stuff. Um, another one, uh, we need larger force. Uh, already in March last year, the government decided that our territorial defense part will be doubled. So it was 10,000 before, by the end of this year, uh, end of third quarter, it's going to be 20,000. Mm -hmm. 20,000 manned, equipped, weaponized, trained, formed into the units, uh, high motivation, ready to defend. That's, that's, a, that's a big part. Um, and, uh, and, and clearly also the uh, sort of wider societal changes, our willingness to defend is uh, highest in history. Uh, and it's not only sort of in the people's hearts and mind, it's actually also in the action. There are uh, the more people joining Defense League than ever. We have conducted... Uh, almost you know five times more reserve exercises than than previous years and we, we're gonna ramp this up we're gonna keep this level on a very very high pace meaning that every reserve soldier like yourself um, uh, need to be motivated uh, and needs to be there uh, understanding what he needs to needs to do and he needs to feel in itself uh, in his you know soul integrity that uh, his service for the country is the most valuable thing that, that you can offer right now as a human being. It was really, I'm really glad to listen to all of this, what we're getting, what we're acquiring and seeing all of these munitions used in Ukraine, this weaponry, I see how effective it is. So uh, I'm glad to hear this, honestly, that my country is, is preparing in my eyes the right way. 
what, what about HIMARS? I know my viewers are also very, oh, HIMARS, they activate it immediately. So we're not talking about the munitions that go 50 kilometers. We're talking about 250 kilometers capability. Yeah, the contract that we have signed also uh, is covering attack camps, uh, the mm. missiles, the ones that go through up to 300. 300, yeah. yeah. And actually, it's also important, not only, not only a military capability. I mentioned uh, the demands that Russia put forward to NATO and the US. And one of these demands was that there should be a ban of um, putting ground-to-ground uh, -ground missiles on the sort of border territory. Mm. Um, well, one-sided demand from Russia. And the only thing that uh, sovereign, uh, self-determined, confident military alliance can do this in, in, in this position is what? To put these missiles there where they can't be on, on Russian mind. Uh, because we do the decisions on our soil and we are determined to uh, defend our country. Yes, um, glad to hear that, honestly. And that puts St. Petersburg well in the range of these missiles, which is the second largest city in Russia, and, and the ports and their Baltic fleet and everything. So that is, I, I could imagine, very scary for Russia if Estonia, Latvia or Lithuania would host HIMARS. Mm. Yeah. Well, I don't know whether we're going to discuss the Navy part after uh, afterwards, but uh, I spoke about land domain. We have also uh, taken a very dramatic shift in the way we also equip our Navy. Uh, so by the end of this year, the deliveries will be made to ship-to-ship -ship missiles. Well, no, sorry, um, surface-to-sea missiles, mm -hmm. basically anti-ship missiles with the same range of almost 300 kilometers. Whoa. Uh, which basically means that the full Baltic fleet is within the range. Um, I, I know that our Baltic friends are doing the same. The same is also coming from our Scandinavian brothers, uh, which basically makes the uh, Baltic Sea a light lake of, um, of NATO. Um, what we have also acquired is, is a pretty impressive quantity of sea mines, uh, which which clearly enables us to do a lot of uh, you know very 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 serious stuff. Saint Petersburg is you could say we we hold the capabilities to blockade it from the sea. Well, potentially, I mean, the, the, this is one of the utility of of these systems, and uh, I'm clearly I'm not gonna you know describe our intent here, uh, but uh, th this is what you can do with this. It's a it's a very good. Continuation of the topic, the next question is about Kaliningrad Oblast and, and its connection to St. Petersburg's ports. Russia supplies most of Kaliningrad Oblast through shipping, I think, with the narrow corridor between Estonia and Finland in the, in the Gulf of Finland. Would there be any merit in the idea of, of um, putting a stop to this and start to check every Russian ship if they're bringing the sanctions, for, forcefully stopping them? Well... One of the most important actions in this year, and also I think the result, uh, looking from the Western side of Ukrainian conflict, is the level of uh, the Western U unity and how we have elevated this and how it has actually uh, actually generated the opposite result as uh, potentially many you know leaders of, of Russia thought. Um, and the economic sanctions is a part of this. Um, and clearly, if we speak about the very, very radical steps in uh, in blockading international trade, uh, that goes really beyond the boundaries of uh, you know legal action, then uh, this ne needs to have a allied backing. Which clearly, uh, Estonia uh, and Finland, I mean the allies who are um, in the Gulf of Finland, um, the e economic impact. Uh, for our economies is there, but clearly on a macro level, uh, this uh, would uh, mainly influence our other allies and, and it, it needs an allied support. I think that's the sort of accurate and sober view view on this, uh, these things uh, currently. Okay. Um, but we talked a little bit, you talked a little bit about what Estonia is acquiring, which weaponry and, and another country which is very aggressively militarizing and weaponizing their military is, is Poland. Should Estonia follow the Polish approach more aggressively, allocating more and more funds towards the military, or is the Polish approach too aggressive? 
Well, Bo- Poland is uh, clearly a great ally of uh, us. It has been one of the uh, one of the most active supporters of Ukraine, not only in the military terms but also showing the political leadership. It's incredible stuff that this nation is doing as as a as a country. So, uh, big, big applause for them and all the Polish uh, listeners. Um, but speaking of facts, then um, Estonia is on the three percent of GDP level. Uh, that makes us a second uh, nation in NATO in, in, in reaching this. Um, our uh, government has uh, now submitted a document that describes the uh, security policy, and one of the paragraphs there indicates that it's government's willingness for the next 10 years to allocate 3% plus, mm-hmm. uh, plus um, money that is associated with uh, hosting our allies here. So it brings us our sort of political intention of uh, defense expenditure above 3%. And I think with this, we have got to the level already where most of Europe was uh, throughout the Cold War. The average defense expenditure of um, of well, European allies in the 70s or at the permanent of Cold War was slightly about 3%. Uh, and um, well, we need to take into account that this lasted almost, you know, 40 years. Mm-hmm. So we are getting there probably uh, to ramp up our defenses on the level that is required for, you know, confronting the conventional threat. Uh, clearly, needs to upkeep the military expenditure on uh, well, clearly on higher level than two percent. Um, if we speak about all the issues that the alliance is facing. And I'm, I'm sure that you have also discussed it in your podcast um, on, um, well, first, the, the, the size of forces is insufficient. The size of uh, weaponry is insufficient. We have spoken about tanks the, the in support of Ukraine. Well, the, the Russians are having, you know, 10 times more tanks than Western allies. Um, uh, the lack of ammunition, the inability to ramp up the manufacturing capabilities. Um, all these issues eventually deduct down to lack of financing. Uh, the most of European allies have been living in the last 30 years in the world of reaping the dividends of peace. And mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not here to patronize about this. Well, we have done the same. Uh, clearly, the, the, the way the world was depicted in the 90s and in 2000s was different. Russia was different back then. And only now they have uh, really, you know, chosen the path that is in the opposite direction to, to the West. Um, and now we, we need to adjust. Uh, and uh, the other manifest of adjusting is defen- defense investments. You cannot credibly speak about taking defense seriously if you are not investing into defense. Yeah, I, it was the norm for, for the Cold War for countries to have 3% plus, and they they lived like that. It was the norm. And now for 30 years we have enjoyed this. These European militaries, you could say, um, not proper equipment, not proper maintenance of the of the tanks. We see in Germany's example how, how the military is in a sad situation in a way. And, and they haven't felt the need to put money into the military because there's no threats. No threat, but... I'm glad Estonia and Poland are the first to open their eyes or always have their eyes open and three plus percent. I hope other European countries will follow. Well, I, I can just, um, you know, pass kudos for uh, also our other Baltic friends. They are doing the same. Uh, the Czech Republic has emerged as a, as a very active country. And, and although Germany gets a lot of bashing everywhere, yeah. then I think it's uh, it's an unfair uh, you, you cannot clearly remedy all the problems that you have gathered in 20, 30 years in, 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 in a one, one year's time. They are putting money into defense. They are showing leadership. They are increasing their military. They are acquiring, you know, basically every category of weaponry on a very high base. Uh, they are determined. Uh, they, they, and they have become uh, one of the sort of most ambitious NATO allies that we have, and I think for Estonia, it's it's an and and the whole Baltic region, it's a very good news. It's uh, I'm glad to hear this because yes, uh, it's been a trend in in people who watch the Ukrainian war to bash on Germany because 
they have been the slowest to to change, but their economy is also the biggest, and the bureaucracy is the slowest. But their economy is very efficient. If it changes, it changes for the good. So uh, I'm glad to hear that Pol Germany gets some points back. I hope the viewer also takes this seriously and, and will give some slack for the Germans. Yeah, and I think in international dipl diplomacy, in defense diplomacy, it's uh, it's important to understand that we we need to make. Um, all our decisions in unison. Mm. We all need to agree, and this is the biggest merit of NATO. Although uh, the sometimes we we get accused that NATO is low, and the you know the slowest common denominator is too low, and all this, but at the same time, it's also the our stronghold. This that if every government agrees that we're going to do something uh, in the merit of North Atlantic security, then it then it also takes the form of a, basically a law. Everyone is uh, determined, everyone takes others' uh, security demands and, and um, well, issues seriously. And uh, the right pathway for this isn't embarrassing our allies or putting them into the sort of negative limelight. The right pathway in diplomacy is to encourage them, uh, find ways to overcome them obstacles, uh, you know, build the political consensus, not break it uh, well we no one is is in position under the umbrella of NATO to patronize over our allies and think think that they are somehow not committed to the defense or are stupid or whatever no they're not they all have their own issues they all have their own priorities uh, they are all committed into defense and we just need to find a way how to you know extract the right right way of uh, acting out, out from the political leadership. I, I totally agree. Uh, there's a lot of talk of Leopards being sent to Ukraine, tanks being sent, and after that there's talk of fire jets being sent. There, no country has said yes. United States had, has not seen, has not said yes about this. But it makes me think, and I think the viewers also. What about the the Baltics? Do do we have any tanks? Does Estonia have any? So I have this one question that everybody wants to ask: What about Estonian tanks? Estonian fire jets? All right, I, I want to make this very clear. Uh, Estonia has tanks. Estonia has tanks in Tapa now. Um, these tanks are being operated, yes, that's true, by British troops and by, by Danish troops. But these tanks are within Estonian 1st Brigade. These are the tanks that are going to go to war with Estonian troops from the first second. Um, so we, we have tanks capabilities. So, so that's there and that's, uh, that's clear. When it comes to acquiring the tanks for ourselves, then uh, you know this question has been up for for years, and uh, and uh, I think here is the moment I need to take my sort of Estonian salesman hat out of my head and really reveal the some grim truth uh, about Estonia. Well, we are a nation of 1.3 million people. That's uh, you know a suburbs of of New York. Yeah. Uh, that has a GDP of, uh, of let's say, there are a few you know, commercial high-rise buildings in New York that generate more revenue that, than Estonia does a year. But usually, you know, these uh, banks don't own their own army. They don't upkeep their own health system. Um, although we are extremely proud of uh, reaching 3% of GDP this year uh, for Estonian defense, and, and I want to put this up here, 1% of lethal aid to Ukraine, first nation to ever achieve this, um, then you're not really going into um, Lockheed Martin or Raytheon or any other weapon supplier with the ch check where 3% of GDP is written all over. You go there with nominal numbers written over. And, and clearly, this 3% uh, generates around 1 billion a year. Um, which is well almost exactly the equivalent number of uh, U.S. spending on military bands and orchestras. Uh, so we we need to uh, calculate and we need to make our choices within this budget. We need to make sure that uh, well we are one of the smallest countries in the world to upkeep conventional three service armed forces for that money. And clearly, if we speak about the sort of uh, higher ticket items like tanks and fighter jets and, and so forth, then, um, well, they have been unaffordable for us so far. 
And and uh, and I want to remind here that our defense expenditure and defense investments always have you know two sides of the coin. One side is you know very clear what what you're gonna get for this money. Let's say we're gonna spend 100 million euros for something. And the flip side of the coin is equal important, but something that remains unseen sometimes. And the flip side tells us the story of what else could we buy for this money. And if the what else is higher military value than the sort of first side, then there shouldn't be a blink of an eye to go for the thing that generates more defense. And as we are operating the quite a large reserve army, then for us it's important that every single soldier would have the right individual equipment. They would have right individual protection. And they would have also right level of uh, uh, stocks because, you know, there is a very large part of morale of our reservists that is just coming from inside. They want to defend our country. Uh, but the other part also is the feasibility of this promise. Is it only the, your patriotism or is it actually a feasible understanding that we're going to win the war? And very important part of this is that we have stocks. We have weapons, we have ammunition, we, we have officers, and, and we are determined to win the war. And um, our priorities for the last 30 years have been in this category, uh, that all our reserve army is not only uh, existing on a paper, like, like you know, much of the Russian troops have, but they are actually there. The, the soldiers are not some, you know, uh, anonymous... Uh, um, social security numbers, but they are, you know, gentlemen like Artur Rehi there, written all over. We know where he lives. We know that he's going to show up in uh, in 24 hours. Uh, we have a special cupboard for his individual equipment, for his gun, for his bulletproof vest, for his armored vehicle where he's going to sit into, and, uh, you know, a healthy amount of ammunition to go to war. Um, and I think this has been a reason why, you know, some of these higher ticket items haven't haven't been purchased, because I don't think that there is an, any reserve, you know, reserve soldier who would be in position to, you know, f feel confident about having tanks, but, you know, not, not having other assets to defend the country. As you said, uh, the stocks make uh, the morale of the troops higher, the motivation higher, and I'm a reserve soldier, and I feel, after this speech, I do feel motivated and a little bit better about it. Um, but would it be correct to say, then, then, if Estonia would have 200 million to allocate, we would rather buy Karl Gustav and Javelin anti-armor capabilities than the armor itself? Well, it has been the case so far. Um, last year, Estonian government invested around uh, 1.6, 1.7 billion uh, euros into the defense. That is around 5% of GDP. There was no other country in the world who, who well, Ukraine was. Let's not discount their efforts. Um, most of this money went into the defense, uh, into ammunition. Uh, rest went into the um, um, indirect fire, the same HIMARS, K9s so forth. Um, and and also on top of this money that was given as an extra, uh, there is also the defense investments that we do regularly uh, uh, according to our national defense plan. And uh, the b biggest ticket item there was uh, putting our second brigade under armor, uh, acquiring the uh, armored personnel carriers for whole second brigade. And we are... Uh, uh, we, with this procurement effort, we are um, well, basically on the finish line, hoping mm -hmm. to get there wi within within months or let's say second quarter of this year. Um, that would serve exactly the same purpose as as you mentioned, and I, I think the 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 financial figure is also well very very close to what you said. Um, I'm glad to hear it because I was an infantryman from Kuperiano, infantry battalion, which means second brigade, for those who don't know. And, and uh, we were joking that I don't want to put, put us down, but that we're a truck, truck battalion because we didn't have armor capabilities. But they're coming now. I'm very glad to hear this. And, and surely if there will be a reserve training exercise, I, I get the feeling of, I've, honestly, I've never driven in one as of now because we, we didn't have the possibility. But I, I'm excited for it if I get the call. 
Well, we are lucky to serve you <laughs> and make you happy. <laughs> um, we see a, a significant shortage of artillery munitions on both sides of the war. Even a country as big as Russia is, is seeing a, a shortage of munitions. Is there any merit in the idea of Estonia making their own artillery, alter, artillery munitions? Well, we have uh, investigated and looked into this uh, issue many, many times. Um, well, clearly as a business opportunity, as something that uh, w would have market around the world, it would ma make a lot of sense. That's that's clear. Uh, but at the same time, we, we need to you know make two elements into account. One is that if you look into the supply chain of the, let's say, 155 shell, mm -hmm. then um, the... Um, well, the life expectancy, or how to say, the, the lifetime of, of these parts uh, is exactly the same as a ready, ready-made shell. So uh, if you want to build up the argument that once the war or crisis will hit, it, hit in, we will have the manufacturing capabilities and everything in place for starting manufacturing then, then, well, materially, it wouldn't make any sense because it's... Uh, it doesn't really give you any edge. It's it's much more efficient to buy all the stocks uh, and store them uh, adequately to uh, be able to use them right away. Um, th that's uh, clearly one thing. The second thing is if we take the technology um, on the, uh, let's say, the smaller cal caliber ammunition, the artillery ammunition, mortar ammunition, well, then basically these are all the ammunition that were invented 60, 70, 80 years ago. And the technology, okay, it has, there have efficiency that, efficiencies that have really made the weapons better. They are more accurate. They will fly longer. Uh, but uh, in basics, it has remained the same. That means that this market all over the world is uh, well, quite saturated. Mm. Uh, there are many manufacturers that makes the, you know, getting the, business case right actually making profit out of this quite difficult uh, especially taking into account that um, uh, most of these manufacturers if you take well, Korea Turkey um, uh, well, Latin America US they are uh, mainly being backed up by the uh, government investments so it would be extremely difficult to uh, uh, let's say to, uh, to compete on uh, on open market on Estonian terms, and when it's difficult to compete, then it means that state needs to go in and subsidi subsidize mm. a part of these investments. And here we need to make it clear, although it sounds like a noble thing to do, we subsidize a weapons manufacturing, but this subsidy would come from the same budget as we are buying the same munition. So eventually it would mean that uh, by the way of upkeeping or creating this industry, um, we also have less stocks. It's a very, very simple equation for us. And clearly, if in 2023 we have uh, to pick or choose between, you know, shell manufacturing factory or uh, sufficient military stocks, then uh, there is no question which which one. I th and I think it's not only the Ministry of Defense's officials, it's it's also every reserve soldier uh, to, to make the right choice. Okay, yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense from the business point of view, what you said right now, yeah. There's, if I listen to this, uh, there's there's no point in making them. If, if you can buy the same stocks and, and, and use them much quicker and you don't have to invest in, in, in the making the factories. Plus, is there a danger Russia can bomb, um, unfortunately, any area of Estonia if they get through the air defense? So they could bomb the factories. If the factories are further west, then... Yeah, I think, and that's one of the uh, large difference between uh, Ukraine and Estonia, that we, we, we lack the strategic depth. Yeah, uh, the 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 territory of Estonia is well, on a bird view, is less than three hundred kilometers. In Ukraine, it's uh, well ten times more. I haven't checked, but it's it's a lot. Yeah. Uh, on Polish border, there is an open supply uh, line that that we lack. Uh, and if uh, th there has been a lot of talk about this Suwalki gap thing and then this mm -hmm. air, de air denial anti access thing. These are all very complex structures, but they actually get to the very simple problem. If Russians get here before allies, we are in trouble. 
because afterwards it's very difficult to get here. Very difficult to resupply. Very difficult to um, well, to supply with more more forces, more ammunition, and all this. That that is the gist of the problem, and th- that that is why um, the European leaders uh, the, in the June last year convened in Madrid. There was a famous Madrid summit that everyone were, were speaking about, especially in Estonia. Uh, and the task of this summit for all the presidents and prime ministers, President Biden, President Erdogan, Macrons, and, and well, everyone were there. So, uh, and the question that was posed to them was that, you know, what are the right conclusions from Ukrainian war to NATO? And for Estonia and for, for NATO itself, the most important conclusion was that if before Russian invasion, to, well, the second invasion to Ukraine, before we had a model of deterrence by punishment, meaning that we had the allied troops here, meaning to trigger the sort of a punishment operation. Um, then on the backdrop of everything that happened in uh, the Irpin, Bucha, everywhere, mm-hmm. this was something that just became politically unacceptable because everyone witnessed that Russia will do. So we don't have time this in between this you know, invasion and punishment. Uh, it's just mm-hmm. politically unacceptable. Uh, there is no politician, no voter uh, in the you know North Atlantic atmosphere who would you know opt into the political goal of first being occupied and then being uh, liberated. So the change that the these political leaders made was that we need to move into the deterrence by denial, which means that from the first second, from the first inch, as the president of U.S. Uh, has repeatedly said, needs to be defended. We need to have uh, Estonian-owned troops, allied troops here on the level that the message that we get out to Russian Federation is that you don't have a chance. There is not a meter that you can gain. There is nothing that you can gain uh, from potentially invading us because what you will lose will be inf- infinitely will be infinitely higher uh, than potential gains. And this is the political goal we are, um, together with our allies, we are uh, working towards. Uh, in Estonia, it means that we are going to form a division, divisional force. Uh, together with our allies, this has been now set up. The work is ongoing. Uh, the British government has allocated one of British brigades. Brigade is a pretty large force. Yeah. You know, 5,000, 6,000 soldiers with all the tanks and self-propelled howitzers and all the weapons that you speak about uh, in this podcast, they're going to be integrated in, in Estonian division. And, and this is going to be the message to Russian that if you think of coming here, this is what you will face. This is what you will face together with high mercies and loitering munitions and everything that NATO is uh, in position to put forward. And well, all the, together, it's a scary stuff. Very scary yeah. stuff, and uh, and we are you know quite confident that we will get this done, and eventually, you know what we are trying to do, we are trying to serve Estonian people with a very simple stuff that it needs to be safe to live in Estonia, it needs to be safe to build businesses in Estonia, to make you know thirty year, fifty year, two hundred year investments in Estonia that you know that mm. these are safe. It's safe to build a house here. It's safe to raise children here. Um, and it's not impossible to um, achieve. I mean, look at South Korea, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, facing the nuclear threat every single day. There is not yeah. a person on earth who would doubt the political stability or economic stability of this country. Take Israel, under con- constant attacks. They have put in place defenses together with their allies that will send the me- same message to their adversaries that you can you know, implement this. You can live in a very dangerous part of the world, but you can be, you know, safe as in in, in a paradise. <laughs> I have nothing else to say that very well said. Um, I I agree with every every word of it, and and this is why we have the tanks here. And do we have fighter jets from the west right now? We we have we have German ones in MRE. and they are constantly rotating. So we have almost all the allies who have security air ba- airspace of uh, politics and this is something that has been ongoing for 20 years now and it's uh, extremely uh, extremely uh, successful mission 
Yeah, I have I have a lot of comments from United States people. We are the back door to Russia or the back neighborhood, and they they sometimes comment, "Oh, do you feel safe in your country? Are you already mobilized to the front?" And I'm saying, "No, we're in the European Union. We're in the NATO. We're we're not. Oh, you're so close to Ukraine." Uh, but the message is that this country is safe for yeah, investment. Yeah, they, they and can for pass people. the same message: safe to travel here, safe to study here, safe to make business here. Mm. Very, very safe. Safer. I mean, look at the map. We are more far away from Ukraine than Berlin is. Does anyone think that it's, weird it's, it's not safe to uh, travel to Germany or Belgium? No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question now about the cybersecurity of Estonia. I am not an expert. I don't know. But it has, as much as I've read the news, Esto- attacks against the stone. Russian cyber attacks against against the stone and have been less successful than Russian cyber attacks against some other European states. Is that true? I think it is, and um, and there is a very simple reason behind it. Uh, the c- cyber defense has been incremental for Estonian society already at least twenty years. Already back in nineties, we started developing the e services. Already in the, the end of nineties, we have e banking, where in the U.S., you know, no no one had heard about it. Um, which meant that if we, you know, put so many sort of very critical and very sort of intimate services to people in online, because if we speak about online banking, for example, or your health data, then it's critical for every customer or every human being to make sure that this data is safe. So no one can access how much money you have or what's your sort of health status. So already early on, we needed to put a lot of attention in, into this cybersecurity part, cybersecurity mm. as a service, that everyone could be sure that it's, the services are designed uh, that they are safe and secure. Uh, then 2007 came. Everyone knows what happened. You know, Russia launched the first state-to-state c- cyber attacks against another country. That was a very new thing, very scary thing at the time. Uh, but I think it is a little bit weird to say this, but it's totally true that in 2017, we actually celebrated the attacks. You know, it's... Uh, sounds even weirder now if we say it, but it's actually true. The only thing that these attacks brought us was were good. It brought us uh, international attention. We were, we still are the front runners of uh, uh, cyber defense everywhere in UN, uh, EU, uh, NATO. Uh, we are making large efforts for everyone to ramp up their cyber defenses. And what, I, what it has... Uh, you know, ended up here in Estonia is that our systems are safer than anywhere else because we take it more seriously. Um, and the more they attack, the you know the the less the results, um, which eventually is also you know a part of deterrence that you cannot intimidate us w- with your actions because we know what we are doing and we are going to confront you. Very glad to hear about that. Um, we have come to the last question, actually, which is uh, about drones. You already mentioned that Estonia is buying loitering munitions, but I'm, I'm strictly talking about civilian DJI drones, Mavic Pro, which even I own. And we see these drones being used in Ukraine to a very great effect, to even not killing infantrymen, but uh, wounding them to the leg. And then three infantrymen have to carry that one infantryman, taking out four from the action. So would there be any point for Estonia to buy these small drones to drop small munitions on infantry? Or we should go to militarized loitering munitions? Well, we're going into militarized. I already spoke about Mm. this. Um, Well, there are hundreds if not thousands of uh, lessons, uh, military lessons from from Ukrainian war. Um, the um, very active use of drones is clearly one of them. And um, and uh, and we you know we are taking this on board, and we're certainly going to buy more. But here I also want to add a little caveat on this: uh, that uh, there is no military lesson, no weapons that are sort of a silver bullet. Mm. Uh, we we all always need to discount whatever we see in Ukraine with a you know simple of comparison of that they use this because you know they they are forced to they they don't have anything else 
so if you speak about the, the ISR or, or intelligence surveillance reconnaissance capabilities, then um, well, there are clearly much more efficient stuff to do this than these civilian used drones. Uh, in order to drop grenades, hand grenades, you know, 150 meters above your head, there is certainly much more efficient ways of, uh, of putting the indirect uh, uh, fire forward than doing it like this. But obviously Ukrainians are in this position because they you know, clearly don't have the other assets on the level that they would need it. So the, the point here is that we need to carefully analyze through it. And this is what you know, our armed forces are doing daily to make sure that our procurement plans are adjusted to the, the, the most recent lessons from, from Ukrainian war. Um, but, but clearly it's an open laboratory for you know, every military around the world to really take into account what works and what, what not. And, uh, and as in any other area, uh, in order to get to these successful elements, you also need to fail. You need to also you know, go through things that are, uh, aren't that successful. All right. Thank you for your time and thank you for all the great answers you gave. My friends, thank you for watching this podcast. And if you like it, subscribe to the channel. And until my next podcast, Slava Ukraina. Thank you.